It's my pleasure to be joined by Jolene Berger, who is running for the House of Representatives in District 33, Seat B. So without any further ado, Jolene, tell us about your background, your, you know, what you've done in your life that brought you to this point where you're standing for public office. Well, I uh, have always had a love for the principles of proper govern governance, um, and it started as a little kid. Um, when I was about five years old, I noticed my dad had a book on his bookshelf called The Naked Communist. And um, I knew there was something important about that book because when my um, dad was telling me about the author, Cleon Skousen, coming to town, I thought he was very important and my dad was going to go listen to him. So when I went to BYU, I uh, noticed that that Cleon Skousen was teaching some religion classes. So I took as many religion classes as I could from him. And when he taught his classes, he interspersed it with proper uh, rules of, of government. And he calls it the success formula of the founding fathers when they uh, when they formed our nation. And um, it was at BYU that I met my husband and we are both musicians. Uh, we left BYU to teach for a few years down in Southern Utah in a little town called Milford. And then we got the job teaching in Idaho Falls. He was the band director and we both played in the symphony there for uh, about 30 years. And we raised two beautiful girls who are uh, now uh, mothers in their own right and musicians in their communities. One lives in Twin Falls and the other one lives down in Lehigh, Utah. And um, we've both been very active in the, we played in the symphony for 30 years. We've been active in uh, volunteer activities uh, I conduct the uh, orchestra and have for 20 years as a volunteer for the Sound Summer Musicals here. This summer we're doing King and I. Um, so I contract the musicians and get them together and rehearse them and, and then do the show in June. Um, when my husband passed away in about uh, 20, in 2012, just the beginning of the school year, uh, it left a void in my life. Uh, it, was, it was a difficult year. Uh, and I just decided that I would uh, pursue my other love of, of my life besides music and uh, volunteering my time that way in the community. Uh, I would get active in, in the Republican Party as a PCO. So I ran against Sheila Olson, actually, and, um, and was the PCO for my precinct and have been for about the last 12 years. I've been reelected six times, I guess five times to make it 12 years reelected. And uh, I just have a passion for the, the, the proper functioning of government. And uh, I know that the Republican platform um, endorses or stands for limited government and limited taxes and um, the sovereignty of the individual and the state and uh, the principle of federalism, things like that. And the problem is in our government, and I see it in Idaho, is that we don't have a definition, at least a lot of the legislators don't have a definition as to how you do that limiting. Where do you, where do you stop and when you, when you um, decide whether to spend money on such and such? And so there are some guidelines that I'd like to, to um, um, champion, I guess, um, as far as how you make your choices in limiting the spending of, of our taxpayers' money. And my my uh, campaign slogan, I guess, is that I'm the voice of the taxpayer. So I'd like to champion those those uh, the proper role of government and 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 where the limits are. So that that's an interesting question, especially coming from you know your region. Something I've started to notice as I've been observing Idaho politics is that, um, I think there's a different view of the role of government between Republicans in, say, North Idaho and Republicans in Eastern Idaho. Um, perhaps it's because of you know all the big you know agricultural firms out there uh, that are, for better or for worse, intertwined with government. I, mm -hmm. I I sense, and maybe this maybe it's wrong, but I sense uh, a lot of the legislators who come out of that region, you know, see a role for government in. Making you know, making those businesses work, you know, subsidizing, carving out tax breaks, uh, creating regulations that favor them. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, do you do you see a way to reduce the size and scope of government while not 
disrupting the economy? Well, I I really believe that the the role of government, as stated in the doctor or in the uh, Declaration of Independence, when it was uh, when it was written, was that it it was to uh, in order to protect the 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 it, it was formed in order to protect the the rights. It's, it was written to secure these rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or the the right to property, mm -hmm. and it's uh, delineated that it uh, gets the, its consent to govern from the governed, and so uh, if if the governed have the authority to do something, then they can delegate that to the government. If they don't have the authority to do something to their neighbor, then they can't delegate that to the government because the government gets its its authority and its permission from the people, from the people. So if I don't have the authority to take somebody's property and give it to somebody who doesn't have it, then I can't cede that authority to the government. So the the uh, the limit that the government needs to abide by is is the fact that it doesn't have the authority to take somebody's money and 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 redistribute it. So basically, I I think that the government needs to stick to that limitation, and that and that's a great that's a great line, you know. Um, you know, legislators go over to let to Boise, and then they they. I think they have a lot of wisdom and they have a lot of background and experience and in their fields. And they use that to decide, oh, well, we can spend eight billion on this, but only three billion on this, but but why not two billion or why not a hundred billion? Well, the, the limit should be, uh, do I have the authority to do that? Because uh, my my constituents don't have that authority. So what am I doing with their money? Well, I should only be doing the things that secure their rights. I shouldn't be giving them out favors and and privileges. It's it's uh, government should use the money that they get by taxing, which we give them the authority to to do, but only to provide protection for our rights, which would be the right to life, and the right to um, my liberty of my the, my bodily autonomy to protect my my area, and um, government should not be in the in the business of giving out uh favors and 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 uh, uh what do you call those things um when you give out something <laughs> money uh -huh. government should limit itself to just protecting rights so the question is how do you get there um oh that's a good question well the 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 sixth star article of the uh, US constitution gives us the uh gives us the key because it says that the in the supremacy clause that all the things that would be written uh, in pursuance of thereof of this constitution would be the law of the supreme law of the land. But there are so many things that are written in the federal government and I can see in our state, Idaho state government, that are not in pursuance thereof of the, of the constitution. The constitution has limited um, powers in article one, uh, section, I believe it's section eight of the US constitution. And they limit, they limit all the powers of the federal government and the federal government has gone way beyond those powers. And so I believe that we should use the power of nullification. The states by uh, amendment 10 uh, have all the powers that were not given to the federal government, the states have them or the people have them. And so if, if there are things written in the um, state or federal constitution, then that are not constitutional, we should do away with them. And I think most of the time we call that the pr principle of nullification. I know that nullification, the word has a bad rap, but we should write some legislation that gets rid of the unconstitutional well, legislation. It's interesting how you know the different people react to it. For example, the you know the, when President Trump was enforcing immigration law, you had leftist cities, blue cities. Uh, declaring themselves sanctuary cities. They were not going to enforce federal immigration law within their borders or with their resources. So the left believes in uh, in nullification. They just, uh, you know, only for their issues. Uh, and then on our side, I think we get a lot of fears of lawsuits. That's something I heard a lot in the Capitol this year. Somebody would propose a law and the debate against it would be, well, you know, since this might conflict with federal law, they're going to sue us and that's going to cost us time and money to fight. So we shouldn't pass it. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I assume you would disagree with that and you'd think, you know, we just need to, you know, challenge the federal government when it is unconstitutional. 
I think so. It might be really difficult. And I've never been sued, so I don't know how difficult, but I, but I think we should stick to the right principles regardless. Well, as, as we're recording this, it was, uh, I think, yesterday that um, Attorney General Raul Labrador and his team were in Washington, D.C. Uh, to argue our abortion ban before the Supreme Court, because uh, the federal government is suing us over it. They're trying to say that we don't have the right to uh, to essentially ban abortion, uh, uh -huh. even, e e even though the Supreme Court already ruled that states do. So, you know, that is time and energy and resources. But, uh, you know, if you're pro-life, if you believe in, you know, the sanctity of life, and if you also believe in state sovereignty, then I'd say it's probably a fight that's worth having. I think so, too. Uh, I, I totally believe in the Tenth Amendment. The states have their own sovereignty. They need to limit this, the federal government. They need to say, no, this is not constitutional. We won't do it. So shifting gears a little bit, you're from Idaho Falls, District 33. That's uh, right. Looking at the map on my other screen here, it, it's a fairly small district. I've talked to some folks uh, already who they represent districts that encompass four counties, uh, whereas Longer. here you're you know, you're just basically the city. So yeah, that I surely that brings its you know unique challenges and flavors. What have you been learning from you know your people from living there, but also from being on the campaign trail and talking to people? Well, I think that uh, my district is known as kind of the donut hole. Here we have District 32, which kind of surrounds the mm -hmm. District 33. So that's the donut, and we're the hole. I think that uh, as a whole, the <laughs> That wasn't a pun. The <laughs> District 33 is, uh, is becoming more liberal because it's the center of the city. And um, I'm talking to a lot of people that are conservative and do agree with uh, holding the, the government as a whole, federal, both federal and state, to the principles that I've delineated, which are only to protect and secure rights, not to give out favors and, and transfer wealth and, and choose winners and losers like in the launch bill and only these certain pro professional pursuits by students can have the money that we that we uh, allotted in in the launch bill. Uh, I'm I'm seeing though that a, a lot of people are um, I think we're being in taught our, our kids are being taught in school the kind of more socialistic values that yeah we do need to redistribute the wealth and we need to help people and I think that we do need to help people but I don't think it's a function of the government. And my district is becoming, I think, more liberal in that area. Um, but I do see a lot of people who would like us to return to the basics of the of the Republican platform, which are uh, limited government and and bodily autonomy. We found that out with COVID that a lot of us were not in favor of being forced to 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 wear masks or have vaccines, and a lot of people are seeing that our freedoms are being uh, eroded. So I'm ready to, I'm ready to make a change on that. Is, is that something you're hearing from people uh, as you go out and, and talk to folks in this race? A lot of people. Yeah. Not everyone though, because a lot of people are being taught that I should force my neighbor to do something because mm -hmm. it's for my good. I don't agree with that. I think that I have the right to protect my own body and my own house. And so I'm a strong defender of the second amendment. And, um, uh, I, I, I just think that the government should restrict itself to 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 making a, a, a situation, an environment where we can have our, our rights preserved and then be free because we, it would be less taxation because we wouldn't be redistributing wealth, be free to uh, have entrepreneurial positions and, and do with uh, our money of what we would want to do rather than give it to the money to, I mean, give it to the government to give it back to us the way they see fit. Now, I've in watching the legislature this year and some of the committee meetings, um, I listened to the incumbent in this race uh, talk from his perspective, you know, it comes from kind of a social work background as far as I, I was able to tell. And so, you know, not not to speak for him, but I, I think the position that he would advocate and that many others do is that uh, there is a role for government to help people or to help organizations that are helping people. Um, I Earlier this year, I've, I've asked everyone about this. Uh, Representative Redmond came up with a bill that would put certain thresholds and expectations in the Medicaid expansion program. Hundreds of people signed up to testify against it because they were worried they would lose their, you know, what they had become dependent on. And that's really the key. So many people have become dependent on government. How do we roll back those 
entitlements, those welfare programs in such a way that we return to the proper size and scope of government, but we don't just leave people who have become dependent on that out hanging out to dry. Yeah, I've thought about that. That's a real problem because we've allowed the dependency to occur and it's and it and it'll only get larger. It'll just only get worse and worse because when you get a free lunch, you don't want to give that up. And so I, I think that and I don't know anything about crafting legislation. I've never been a legislator before, um, but I would work to get resources to to help to do something where you uh, you you would have to do it gradually. Mm -hmm. You would have to to, you know, you'd have to have a gradual approach where, um, I don't know, over time, things would be gradually um, eliminated. And uh, I think it's not the role of the government to, to, to say, well, I can take all this money that we have because the taxpayers have given all this money. It's, it's like free money to the government. Oh, wow, we can spend all this money. Well, it, it, why don't you take your own money and help your neighbor who who needs a new car? I think that it should be done through charities and churches and, and neighborhoods and families that we need to help people. It was the same thing I thought about the uh, the abortion issue. If to to just cut it off and say, yeah, we're banning abortions all just all right at once. That's kind of harsh. But I'm a, I am pro life, and I think that every child from the moment of conception is uh, is valuable. And but maybe there needs to be a gradual approach to it. I, I, I don't know how that would happen, but I, I do think some things have to have to be done gradually because we as a people, we we gradually got into this. Now we need to gradually get out of it. And so it, it would have to be a an approach where I don't know, certain things would would sunshine or, or sunset, I mean, at a certain date and other things would cert, would sunset at a different date and and down through down through time. Um, speaking of abortion, uh, you know, obviously, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dobbs case that states can ban abortion if they choose, and Idaho did that. Uh, there's yeah. a handful of exceptions. There's still, you know, out of state abortion pills that are, you know, surely coming in through the mail. Oh. Um, yeah. And I just read recently that some left wing groups are preparing a ballot initiative for 2026 uh, to try and get abortion on the ballot, which, mm. you know, it, it, it's a hard one to gauge because you have, you know, position that life begins at conception, all abortion is murder. And then, you know, a baby should, you know, is not a human being until um, the parent decides, maybe that's at birth, maybe that's at age two, who knows? Uh, so I, I guess I would ask, you know, what do you think of our current laws? Do you think they're good? Should they be, you know, more strict? Should they be loosened? And what do we do as a state to prepare for the debate that's going to be coming in the next couple of years? Yeah, that's a hard one. I think that if we could free up the money of the people with less taxes and 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 less spending on the part of the government, and it would be a gradual thing because it would be a shock when uh, and and maybe it has been throughout the state where uh, um, abortion has been limited. Uh, by the trigger law when the uh, Supreme Court ruled that it was up to the states to decide and our in our our state is is a pro-life state and and ruled that except in cases correct me if I'm wrong of rape and incest and I think they include health of the mother also is that correct a life um, of the mother at least the life of the mother oh okay yeah I think that's a good way to put it because the health of the mother can be uh, expanded to well my ankle hurts. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, maybe there needs to be some kind of a campaign. We could make a campaign to to encourage churches and and charities to step up because there there needs to be some help until until it, it's uh, until we go back to the mentality that that uh, life uh, begins at conception. Uh, we, we're going to help have to help people that are in trouble that haven't been able to change their lifestyle yet. Well, and that's, and... Uh, that, that runs into, you know, the, that whole charity thing we were talking about um, er, earlier this year in the session, the legislature passed a law that would automatically, you know, if, if a pregnant mother is on Medicaid already, um, typically, you know, she would be on Medicaid until the baby's born. And I think it was like 60 days and then they would be disenrolled. Now they're automatically going to be enrolled into the Medicaid expansion program, which will last then a year. 
Uh, so, so it is expanding that welfare state. But the argument they used was that, well, we banned abortion. We're pro-life. So we need to support the mothers and the children. Um, so do you think the government has any role there or should you know churches and charities step up? Ideally, I think the government does not have a role there. There, it's not the government's job. It's it's our neighborhoods and our families and our churches and our charities that have the job. If we let the government take over that job, we 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 become automons and we we don't care about our neighbors. And that's what's happening in our society. We 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 forget each other because the government will take care of the problem, and it's it doesn't build a strong society. Shifting gears once again, um, one of the big debates in the legislature this year was over illegal immigration. Obviously, it's an issue down on the southern border. Uh, Idaho has a, a very small international border on the north border. Uh, there were two memorials that came through the legislature. One was very harsh. Uh, it called out the big agricultural companies for wanting cheap labor and hiring, You know, not being very discriminating about who they hired, whether they're legal or illegal. And it called to impeach the president close the border. And then that one didn't pass. But the one that did pass was more from a perspective that we need to reform the system to bring in more legal workers. And a lot of the fiercest debate on this issue in favor of, well, not deporting illegal aliens or not enforcing immigration law came from eastern Idaho. Uh, so, you know, what what do you think about that issue? How how should Idaho handle that? And, you know, what what can the legislature do? What should we do in our state. Um, obviously, one of the warnings they gave us was that if you deport illegal aliens, it'll crash the economy because they're doing all the work in the, in these fields and it's jobs Americans won't do. You know, that's a really good, that's a sticky problem because once you become dependent on migrant workers, then, then yeah, if you, if you, if you cut that off, then you're, then you're stuck until you gradually f encourage the teenagers or the, um, homeless or somebody to step in and do those jobs. So it would be a shock. Uh, but I really think that the uh, the laws that allow the migrants in uh, legally are set up, on, and, and I don't know this for sure, but I assume that they're set up in order to, to um, allow the right number that would be um, something that, that our economy could handle uh, I know I've talked to people that say, well, you know, it's so hard to come in legally that everybody comes in illegally. Um, but I think there's a reason why it's hard. And that is because it's uh, I think that they probably have some kind of um, standards or something that 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 are set up in place so that, that we, um, you, we we allow the people that would that, that could contribute to the country without overburdening it, which is what I feel we've got right now. There's an overwhelming influx and um, uh, they're just living off of the the phone and the, the housing and the jobs that the, the federal government is giving them. And so I, I don't know how 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 you would change that to to allow more people coming in if if it's something that our can't, economy can't sustain. Does that make sense? Um, I I do think it would be a shock to the system to of of the economy if we if we deported all illegal immigrants. Um, I really don't know, but I really think that people should do their best to to be legal, and that we should try to encourage our our citizens to take the jobs on farms. I think that the the, the migrants are taking away jobs that 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 our American citizens could do. I could be wrong about that. Because I'm not a farmer, but I know that they do tell me that. Um, some of the farmers, you know, or the people connected to farms in the legislature, they they say Americans won't do those jobs. But I wonder if it's a, you know, a chicken and egg thing at this point, because now that they've, you know, become so dependent on a migrant workforce, uh, that's just where you go for the jobs. And, you know, I don't know, do they post these jobs for you know, say teenagers or young people to apply for, uh, if everybody on, you know, in a certain industry is, you know, speaking Spanish, does that close off people who don't speak Spanish to, you know, apply? I don't know. It's, it, I, I wonder how that actually comes about and what we can do about it. That's a good question. I think that we need to, I think that we need to make it America first and Idaho first, uh, first. 
Yeah. So Bonneville County has been the center of a lot of uh, drama with the party politics. Uh, obviously, two years ago, the party, um, you know, endorsed some candidates in the primary and then then chairman Tom Luna sued the party. And that was a big contentious issue at last year's convention. Um, you know, we've cleared up the rules. Parties can endorse and parties can even uh, censure uh, legislators who they don't believe are following the platform. And that's been happening. Um, yes. So what can you tell me about the role of the PCs and the party committees in holding their legislators accountable? And how does that interact with the role of the voters in, you know, electing them in the first place and then, you know, voting for them and for reelection? Well, as a legislative district chairman, I had four uh, PCOs come to me who were unhappy with our legislators, one of whom I'm running against. And so as a legislative district chairman, I was bound by the new rule, the Article 20 uh, that was that was written at the last uh, um, Republican meeting. And so we held, we invited them to come and give their side of the story and they didn't come. Uh, so two of them were censured, one of whom is my opponent. Um, so I was really in favor of that uh, new rule because we are seeing across the whole state the, um, I believe it's dishonesty of, of people who are really more in line with the other side of the aisle, the democratic values, and, and know that they can't get legislation passed. So they, so they change their affiliation, but they keep their own ideology and, and they call themselves Republicans when, they're, when their ideology is not. And so they vote with the with the democratic and and, and more Marxist and socialist ideas. I I, I see that the uh, the Democratic Party is becoming more socialist in in its ideas and in its voting. And and the only thing that can happen as we do that is that the country will become more and more socialist, and the government gets more and more power. It only grows, it never limits itself. Um, and so uh, I, I was really in favor of holding our uh, officials to. Uh, the Republican Party platform if they are going to call themselves Republicans. And there are a lot of PCOs in our in our uh, in, in my district and in our Bonneville County Central Committee who really agree with that because the, the the constituents, you know, our legislators call them their constituents. They say, well, I vote, I, I vote according to my constituents. Well, the constituents go by what they see on the ballot on the day of the election. They see an R or a D and then they vote for the R. And that's really all they have time to, uh, to research to. They don't have time to research, but the PCOs and who go to the central committee meetings uh, are up on things and it's their job to be up on things and to let their constituents know in their precincts. Um, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that, that actually is a, 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 a thing that needs to happen so that, uh, the, uh, the people that go to the vote can see an R and, and trust that it's an R and trust that it's an R that supports all the, the, uh, the tenets of the Republican platform. And if they can't trust that because of the fact that there's dishonesty, then then our society will crumble because where do you what how do you how do you deal in a society without trust? So the voters they rely on um, um, they rely on the PCOs and the Central Committee to do the research and to declare that this candidate is indeed a candidate who will support the Republican platform or this one isn't. And I think that's become very um, needful and helpful. Well, you mentioned something uh, just now about how the Democrats are moving left. And I would say both the Democrats and the Republicans are moving left. Democrats yeah. move left. Um, yeah, this is my left. And uh, and it kind of <laughs> pulls the Republicans. And so sometimes you get people who, you know, 10 years ago, they would have been a Democrat. And then the Democrat Party moves left and the Republican Party is also moving. And now suddenly they're within the Republican umbrella even though their views haven't changed. And so they say, okay, well, I'm a Republican now. Um, and maybe they adopt some ideas like tax cuts or you know, get a little bit more friendly to the Second Amendment, but they still have the same views on, say, you know, abortion and the LGBTQ stuff and you know, public funding of various programs. And, and, and But then they say, you know, I am a Republican. And how, how do you fight against that? Because anyone who you know, stays still over here on the right 
they inevitably get called a, an extremist and a radical uh, because, you know, everyone else is moving this way and their way over here. Uh, and, and that's the label. And people are scared of extremism and radicals. They they don't want that. They want normalcy. They they just want things to quiet down. So so how do you promote conservative values that are unchanging um, and also fight that perception that you're some sort of extremist? Well, that's a that's a difficult problem. I think the the way you fight it is that you declare the principles of the Republican platform and you stick with them. You study them. A lot of people haven't studied it. I know. I, I'll admit. Uh, Twelve years ago, when I became a PC, uh, oh, I, uh, I, I thought I was a Republican. But I think the reason I thought that, that was because I'd grown up in a Republican household. I hadn't studied. I'll, I'll admit, I hadn't studied the Republican platform, but I called myself a Republican. Well, now we're encouraging all of our PCOs in the Central Committee to study the platform. In fact, we take a tenet of it every meeting, and and we um, study it so that of our. Our, our PCOs are all, all informed on the, the tenets of the platform. And so I think you the, the platform doesn't move unless at a convention, mm -hmm. the platform changes because of the will of all those people that get together and come to a convention and decide to make a change. So you, you have to stick with some principles. So you stick with the platform and, and you say, well, that's, that's a Republican. And that's the reason I'm a Republican right now is because I support the re Republican platform. There's one minor detail that I don't support, and that is in school choice. I believe that we should have school choice. I just think that it, in the platform, it specifically mentions the ECA, the educational or ESA, educational savings account. And I think that a tax credit is better. So I would have voted for that this last session, the school choice. So you allow the people to change the platform as they think they need to, but then you stick with it. So hypothetically, then, if this year's convention changed the platform radically, um, you know, on a lot of issues that you know you believe in, what what do you do then? Uh, would you still call yourself a Republican or form a new party? Or yeah, I'm. I don't know. It's because uh, you're right. The platform does change every two years. Usually, it's minor changes. Yeah. And you know, the last ten years or so, the Repub Idaho Republican platform has gotten, I would say, more conservative. And so, I, I can see maybe some of the more moderate Republicans saying, "Well, I believe in you know what Republicans stood for twenty years ago, and uh, and and not this extreme stuff." Uh huh. So so yeah. so so, how do you reconcile that? Well, of course, it's the majority of people who vote whether to change it or not. So it would be the will of the people if it if if the Republican platform is changed to be more moderate or more or more what we call rightist. I actually don't believe in the the, the terminology that that we presently use where we have the right and the left. I actually believe in um, a more um, um, a sensical approach to it. Cleon Skousen um, delineates this in his book, The 5,000 Year Leap, where he, he, he delineates 28 principles of natural law that he read that the founding fathers, Cicero de Montesquieu, John uh, Adam Smith, uh, John Locke, um, who's the, the writer of uh, the law, Frederick Bastiat, he, he delineated 28 principles of natural law that they used, and they used an approach where uh, on, on one side, there was monarchy, which was ruled by a few or by one tyrant. And on the other side, and I'm not going to say right or left, is, is anarchy where there's no rule. And in the, in the middle, there's a balanced center. And I believe that the principles that, that protect our rights and, and don't let government get big are right in the center. And so that's where I would describe myself as being in the in the center. And I believe the Republican planter platform is really close to that um, as being in, in the balance center. So basically, I it's not moderate in today's terminology of moderate, but it's balanced in, mm -hmm. in the center between monarchy and, and a anarchy. Um, let's see, I kind of lost my train of thought. You talking uh, about what happens if the platform changes? Uh, you know, can you oh. still call yourself a Republican? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I think that if I if I didn't agree with a, a, a drastic change in the Republican Party, I would have to say I don't agree with that. And I would either have to change. I don't think I would change to the Democratic Party because I just <laughs> don't agree at all with all those things. Maybe I would have to form a new party. I don't know. I've looked into the Constitution Party. I, I've uh, I haven't decided to go that way because I don't think that they have the 
the uh, the the power the you know a lot of people just don't know about them but i believe in the constitution it's one of those documents that we need to strictly follow and 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 not just twist and wrangle and and make it say what we want it to say yeah. unfortunately that's uh, that's the way people do it nowadays <laughs> you're right i think we need to get back to basics and we need to follow the handbook it's the idaho constitution the u.s constitution and the platform if we're going to call ourselves republicans we need to stick to those things and follow them mm. and not get outside them otherwise yeah we're, we 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 need to do something else and when i wrote my uh letter to the two that we censured in our legislative district 33 i said you know you're voting more like a democrat i think i would recommend that you change parties <laughs> I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you wonder how much of that is you know, people who think that they're, you know, they really are upholding Republican principles and that, you know, they're fighting against extremism in the party. Or maybe, you know, some people, I'm not, you know, not specifically naming anyone, uh, but, you know, I wonder if some people just make a calculation that uh, the R brand is more popular in certain regions than the D brand. So we're going to go with the R. And, if it was the opposite, they would have no problem with the with the D. Oh, that's possibly true. That's possible. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, and it all it all goes back to education. You, we need to encourage our populace to be more educated and learn. What does the R stand for? What does it? What does the D stand for? Popular uh, or not? I like I like what some candidates out here have said. The R stands for research. Go out and research your candidates. Oh, <laughs> that's good. I like yeah. that. So I've appreciated your time today. Is there anything else we didn't cover or any closing thoughts you have? Uh, no, I, I, I just thank you for your time and, and, and giving me the opportunity to express these opinions. And I think that the, the Founding Fathers success formula, it was divinely inspired of the U.S. Constitution. I think the Idaho Constitution was also, and I think that it's got the, the tenets for a, a, an economy with, that would give the money back to the people, let them keep their own money rather than giving it to the government. I think that would that would solve a lot of our problems if we'd follow the, those handbooks. And thanks again for letting me share my thoughts. Jillian Berger, candidate for House of Representatives, District 33, Seat B. Thank you. Thank you.